Well, my name is Len Edwards, and um, I'm a, um, I spent my career in the Canadian Foreign Service. Um, I retired a few years ago. I was the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs for Canada in my final assignment, but I've also been an ambassador here in Korea many, many years ago. Um, I was ambassador in Japan. I have uh, covered Asia Pacific extensively in the course of my career. At one point in the 1990s, I was the APEC senior official for Canada, mm -hmm. and we hosted the APEC summit in 1997 in Vancouver. So I'm quite familiar with Asia, but I've also uh, worked in other parts of the world as well. You know, I, I think interregional being between regions of, uh, of the world, for instance, um, the one big example that is often cited uh, for interregional cooperation is between the European Union and, uh, and the ASEAN group of countries, the ASEM and so on. But there are other examples too. Um, I like to think that the, that the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership is an interregional agreement between North America and South America and, and Asia. So there are other, other examples as well, both of a very general nature, but efforts that bring the countries of one region together with countries of another under the, under the, the heading of, a, of, of, two glo of two regional institutions that work on peace and security, but particularly on economic. I think economic affairs have tended to be the major area of concentration for inter-regional cooperation. Well, I, th I think you're absolutely right to underline the difficulty that inter-regional cooperation is facing. Um, if anything, uh, some of the strains and stresses that, uh, that we encounter today, the, the questioning of, of international institutions generally, um, the failure of uh, a number of countries, and right now uh, one worries particularly about the American administration's policies towards, uh, towards inter-regional activity of one kind or another. Um, these, um, these are putting a high price, I think, on the need for more effort on interregionalism. But I'm not optimistic in the sense that uh, I think the efforts that will be required are higher or greater than we've had before. The environment is simply not especially positive. Uh, but it does mean we have to, we have to, take, we have to take steps where we, where we can. Um, and if you look at the different regions, I, you know, I, I'm not very positive about uh, the North American region as a, as a, a partner right now because of the, the strains uh, uh, present in the region now with the, the uh, renegotiation of the NAFTA at the, basically at the request of the uh, Trump administration. Um, we are finding generally that uh, countries like Canada and Mexico are very preoccupied with regional cooperation uh, that's been part of our makeup for several decades. So to kind of reach out for interregional cooperation is, is tough. There's no question in my mind that Asia remains uh, probably the best region for leadership now in promoting interregional cooperation. And I guess you could say within, within Asia, Northeast Asia and South Asia, are two different regions, even though we talk about the Indo-Pacific, Northeast Asia. So I think that if countries like Korea um, can promote inter-regional cooperation from Northeast Asia down into uh, South Asia, that it will, at a time of, of stress on inter-regionalism, this will stand as a positive example. So when the world returns to a better place for inter-regionalism, these, uh, these initiatives will stand out. Well, um, you know, it's a, it's a very troublesome relationship right now. Um, it has been for several years. And um, I've always believed that this relationship will be sorted out between the two major powers, China and the United States, over time. Um, and it has led to increased tensions. Um, the economic Tensions have tended to be downplayed. Security tensions have, have, have uh, been raised. Uh, but uh, it's very worrisome now that the, the, uh, the so-called trade war that seems to be emerging between the United States 
and China, I think is a very unsettling feature and one which um, could overlap on the relationship generally that needs very, very careful management by leaders in Beijing and Washington as they sort out this new strategic relationship that they need to work out. The rest of us are, are bystanders. We are not going to help with that. That has to be worked out between the principal players. But what we can do is that we can um, ensure that through initiatives like interregional cooperation um, and so on, that, that we, and, and, are, and dealing with small issues that, that create larger problems, see little security issues or economic issues, that we make sure that the international playing field is absent any, to the extent that we can affect them, that, that it, it, it's as positive as possible so that the, the two great powers can, can work out their relationship over the longer term. So in that light, uh, it, it, it seems to me, therefore, going back to the question of regional cooperation, that pushing ahead with, with cooperation that tends to deal with economic irritants, that helps deal with some of the security threats, particularly the new kind of threats that we find now, uh, movement of refugees, uh, the uh, uh, piracy, natural disasters, all of the things that, that, that create um, small pit points of tension in the Asia Pacific region, particularly where this relationship between China and America is going to be, I think, largely resolved. That if we can do that, and Canada can do that, Korea can do that, working with our friends in the region, that we have played a, a positive role in helping these two great powers come to an accommodation. Well, um, I, I think it's quite clear that, that in the current state of, the, of, of play since the Singapore summit that, uh, that basically there are two Korean players and there are two major international players, the United States and China. And for the time being, um, the, the conversations between North Korea and in Washington and between North Korea and Seoul, I think are two uh, are two uh, uh, parallel activities that need to, to proceed in, 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 um, in sync. Um, but China is definitely in the mix in terms of, um, of, of, of its relationship with, with North Korea. So uh, I, I see those four players as the sort of key right now. Uh, you mentioned Russia, you mentioned Japan. Uh, they were part of the six-party talks. They have a stake in peace in the region, uh, the denuclearization of the peninsula, and so on. So um, they need to be consulted. Um, obviously, Japan particularly, I believe, is an important country that be consulted. And eventually, perhaps, they can be brought into a, an, a, to the meeting tables and so on. But right now, I think it's kind of where it needs to be. Um, as for Canada, um, you know, we're a long way from the Korean Peninsula, but um, Korean, uh, sorry, Canadian soldiers fought in the Korean War. Uh, 516 soldiers died defending uh, South Korea from the tyranny of, 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 of the North, of the, the communist attacks. Um, so we are deeply committed to um, South Korea, to the Republic of Korea and we will give every possible support uh, to the Korean government going through this difficult time. But at the same time, so apart from giving support um, and, and doing everything we can to persuade uh, North Korea to denuclearize and completely denuclearize, as the agreement in Singapore says, um, there, are, there may be other things that we can do and we, we stand ready. I can't speak for the government, of course. I may be used to, but I don't anymore. Um, we will do whatever we can to be helpful in that respect. You know, for instance, working with Seoul to help build bridges uh, to North Koreans, um, standing by if needed to, uh, to assist in any way. I think that's the kind of, of, of help we can be, but we're not involved in these talks and I don't think there's any prospect of our needing to be involved. The players that are, must be there are there. Well, to go back, that's sort of like the first question. Uh, well, um, about regionalism or inter-regionalism? Regionalism. Well, again, I think it's, it's, under, it's under threat. Um, 
uh, it, it used to be, you know, that, um, that going back three decades, we were, we were all such supporters of the multilateral system, the international system. Particularly, I was working on trade issues at the time. And we believed that the, the World Trade Organization, as it became, or the GATT in those days, should be the single place where we do trade agreements and so forth. They needed to be multilateral um, and, you know, most favored nation. All of the principles that were set up uh, for the GATT uh, after the Second World War. And, and we saw a lot of regional trading agreements spring up at the time. And there was concern that, that this would undermine the multilateral system. I think in retrospect, and here NAFTA was a major agreement uh, that was completed uh, outside the multilateral uh, system, although it was compliant with the rules of the GATT and now the WTO. Um, there was a feeling that somehow this was under, uh, undermining. But now I think um, there is, the regional system has in fact bolstered uh, the multilateral system. Uh, and so strong regionalism, providing it is consistent with the international principles that we've set for ourselves, um, is actually a, 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 a strong building block for good institutions, good governance internationally by uh, not only having a multilateral framework but also regional frameworks that are consistent with. And I think right now we are seeing two problems. We're seeing um, an attack on the on our, uh, you know, the, what, we, what we have called the liberal international order, which is the, the institutions set up, the Bretton Woods systems and so on. We're seeing those threatened. Um, we are seeing a, a breakdown in, even in, um, in countries that have benefited from it, like Canada, like the United States and other places, uh, populism and, and uh, political leaders that are now questioning some of the benefits that were uh, brought uh, with them. And that's affecting regionalism. I mean, we see what I was describing, what's happened in, with, in North America, the, the uh, renegotiation of the NAFTA, of uh, the threatened uh, tariffs uh, by, uh, by the pr Trump administration on automobiles in Canada and Mexico, uh, the action taken on steel and aluminum. It's, it's very chaotic and it's very, very troubling. So um, I am, I'm hopeful <laughs> that regionalism uh, can still be where it is strong, and I think it is strong here in Asia, uh, can still thrive and prosper and serve as an example of the kind of you know, regional activities that are needed, approaches that are needed to, uh, to, uh, to sustain our international structures. Um, and we need them, you know, they have to be based on a value systems and so on. That, uh, that, are, that protect smaller countries, those without power from the larger countries. That was the whole framework of the international order that's been set up. Of course, democracy is usually important. Not all countries these days are, are democratic. So I think countries like Canada and Korea, um, as champions of democratic systems, champions of the, of the order that have been so important to us, both in economic and security term, we need to work, work very hard together uh, to make the changes in the international system that keep them relevant. Um, and regionalism is one of the tools we can use, but it is tough these days. Well, I, you know, um, I've, this conference this, this, this year, uh, I think is, it's already doing a superb job. It's covering so many issues of, that cut across, you know, the the kinds of things that support peace, the irritants that undermine peace, how you, you know, how you, and prosperity. Um, I think if there is one area that, that and it's a, it's a, it's a, a tricky one, uh, and that is uh, to go back to the question you, you asked about, um, about the relationship between the United States and China. Um, can, the, can the forum tackle a few items or a few areas uh, that um, that actually deal with um, the kinds of uh, um, points of friction that divide uh, the United States from China at a time when they are contending for 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 power, um, the, the current hegemon and the rising one. 
And I think, you know, um, it goes back to your question about what we can do, but if we can engage out in discussions, which include China, which include you know, United States representatives, um, ab about some of the, the, the issues that trouble us, the rest of us, um, and that we believe need to be um, regulated and sorted out between these two powers. I think we could be, that could be helpful. And um, since Korea sits right next to China, and you know we sit right next to the United States, um, I know that's that may be uh, that may be a tough idea for uh, for Koreans to take on, but I think it's absolutely essential that there's more talk, there's more discussion, more openness, more transparency uh, among the rest of us who are going to live with the result of this contest between the United States and a rising China. Any last words? Well, I think you've asked me so many questions, I don't, don't have any last words. I, I would like to, you know, one thing I'd like to say is I think the, the Jeju Forum is, is a truly uh, well, remarkable uh, thing. And, and I, I can, I'm, I'm, you know, it's what, 13 years old now, so it's, it's moved uh, into space that I think is absolutely essential. And uh, I'm very grateful for the welcome I received here, and I've enjoyed being here. I've, I've met a lot of new people, even though I'm very familiar with Korea, having been ambassador here many years ago. So for me, it was a truly um, interesting and, uh, and a learning experience. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much for